Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a brand new episode of a whole new ball game. It is Sunday morning when we're filming this, but when you're listening, it's probably Monday. Maybe it's later in the week. We're fired up for a brand new week. We've got Boog Shambi, Brooks Webb, and Nancy Newman this week on the podcast, and we could not be more excited. Alex, tell us how you're feeling. I'm feeling pumped up for this week. It's the greatest week ever. It's a holiday season. And we got a huge week for everyone this weekend. And like I said in the beginning of this episode that we'll get into the interview of Boog. Boog is, no offense to anyone I've ever interviewed, but Boog is well, probably one of my favorite people to ever interview. He's just such a fun guy to talk to. And Vinny, I think you can attest to that after interviewing him for the first time this past week. Yeah, he was really good. Um, but because I'm more of the current events guy, it's a big day this Sunday morning. It is 11 a.m. Sunday. The date is the 20th of December. We've got a lot of football today. Fantasy football playoffs are rolling. Fantasy basketball is about to start. The NBA season kicks off on Tuesday. And to cap off the week, it's Christmas on Friday. So what a week that we have in store just personally because of the amount of things going on in the world. I mean, it is just a huge week. I am fired up especially for Football Sunday. You're fired up for these interviews this week, especially Boog, because he's your favorite. And, I mean, we're just rolling. I mean, honestly, we're just rolling here, and I'm pumped for it. 100%. And I know we are recording this before the Jets-Rams game today, but I can't wait to see your reaction to just another Jets loss. Well, I picked the Jets to win, which I'm pretty biased because I always pick the Jets to win. But, yeah, I mean, I'm excited. It's a primetime game because if you're, if you're watching on the Sunday ticket, the Chiefs and the Saints are going to be blacked out because that game is going to be televised nationally. So that game will be blacked out if you have the Sunday ticket, which means you have to choose between the Cardinals and the Eagles and the Jets and the Rams. I am watching the Jets and Rams game, baby. And I, this week I'm going to try to watch the whole thing. Last week – it got out of hand early, and it was tough to watch. Uh, so that was a little tough, tough loss. But this week, I'm hoping to stay tuned for all four quarters. What is your opinion on taking? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Well, from a player side and from a player um, like mindset, I hate it. I hate it. And from a fan side, I hate it. Like, sure, could it lead to better things in the future? Yeah, but it's really hard to watch. And I'm not saying Jets are tanking or aren't tanking, but it would be really hard to watch if they were purposely trying to lose football games. Because as a fan, I tune in to watch them compete and to win. So it's tough to watch if they're not trying to put the product on the field that's going to win football games. We've got some good pieces. I'm excited for the future. But also, it would be really heartbreaking to know that they are purposely trying to lose football games. And I don't necessarily think they are because it looks like the effort is there. So, you know, I just want to keep it at that. And I want to keep trying to win football games because as a fan, that keeps me more interested. It keeps me more likely to buy a jersey or something like that if I know the team is trying to win football games in advance into the playoffs, win the division, whatever it may be, whatever the end goal is, which is obviously win a Super Bowl. But, you know, you got to set smaller goals before you set bigger goals. But so I really hope they're not trying to lose football games because – that's not me. I don't try to lose anything. So I really hope that every single time they step on the field, there's one goal in mind, and that is to win the win the football game. Well, I, I mean, it's interesting, and, and we can get into this maybe in depth at a later time. But without further ado, see what I did there, Vinny? I let it off this time yep, without further good. ado. Let's get into it with Boog Shambi, ESPN broadcaster for Major League Baseball and college basketball. He's the best. Now here he is. Welcome into a brand new episode of a whole new ball game on today's episode. No offense to everyone out there in the world who I've interviewed in the past, but this guy right here, Boog Shambi, is my favorite person <laughs> to interview. Wow. Uh, so Boog, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today and joining a whole new ball game. You're a two-time guest. You are a third person that has been on a second time, but the first and the new era of a whole new ball game. So appreciate you coming on the podcast today. 
Well, I'm grateful. And that compliment, Alex, you're going to set the bar a little bit higher. Um, but I thank you. I'm grateful for that. That's very good. Yeah, he, th he threw you right into the fire there. I mean, right into the fire. You can't, we got to go up from here somehow. Oh. I mean, he just, and he's been talking about you for days, for days about how great of an interview you're going to be. So I'm excited to All just. Right. <laughs> I didn't, I got to get some coffee or something. Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. Well, Boog, I mean, talk about coffee. I mean, every single broadcast you do, it's three things, right? Three things. Smart, interesting, and find out what's important. And that's how you do not only just your broadcast, but I think you might argue this, but life. Is that true or not? Ooh, yeah. I mean, I don't – I think I'm better at it as a broadcaster than that I am in life. You know, I'm human just like everybody else, and – you react to things and um, you try and be smart and interesting and fun, but um, it's just not always so easy. We're all human in that, in that regard. But uh, you know, the, with broadcasting, that's always been my thing. I like to find, you know, work hard at, at prep that draws out interesting stuff. I want it to be kind of smart and thoughtful, but you also have to have fun. I mean, I, I think, uh, it's an important part of it. I think most of the guys I work with know it, you know, my most recent game, I got to work with, with Jay Billis and he and I have worked together enough, you know, he mainly works with Dan Shulman, but I, I probably do a half dozen games with him a year and we've worked together now, you know, this year that many times. And yeah, he knows I like to play and I don't take myself too seriously. If I say, something dumb I'm going to throw myself under the bus first and foremost so I, I, I like to have fun with it it's sports you know it's not uh it's not rocket science now Jay's so, very serious by the way Jay's very serious when it comes to broadcasting yeah no Jay's serious but but like I have some of that too I mean Jay likes to preach a little bit but I will say this the things Jay likes to preach about I'm down with like I think they're they're serious you know we did this game the other night and Illinois was up by a dozen and word leaked out college basketball and word came out that Michigan state and Virginia had been canceled due to COVID. And so Jay started talking about, okay, so now we are where we are. Where is our national discussion about this? If we were starting right now, would we start and would we play? And he said, I think the answer is no. And then he brought up the idea of, you know, the players want to play. And he said, I'm sensitive to that. He said, but if we were at a football game and there was lightning in the area, we wouldn't canvas the players and ask them, hey, you really want to play? That's not relevant. And he also made the point that we haven't really had a national discussion about this. And I chipped in and saying, you know, this is the sport, college basketball, that all this stuff started with. I mean, it started back in March. So what have you been doing in terms of a plan? You, you, you saw where it was and what it could get to. And at the very least, you should have thought, OK, come November, if it's this bad, how do we go about handling this? And they don't really have a plan. And it, it feels like the plan was, wow, I really hope this goes away. So anyway, yes, Jay is serious. But I also, you know, I mess with him. We showed a a guy with uh, with red hair and a red beard and like the director just like came back tight on like we have, sorry, the Cameron crazies, we have pictures of them. So he goes in tight on this one guy and I was like, there's my guy. And Jay's like, what are you talking about? Do you know him? And I'm like, it's a ginger. He's part of the family. And I said, you know, Jay, we're unique. We're like one, two percent of the population. We're like unicorns. And then where he gets me, he says, you know, I don't believe that 1% of the population is unicorns. And I'm like, okay, Mr. Lawyer, Mr. Fact Checker, fine. It's not 1% or unicorns, but we're very unique. So, so how, does, how does that kind of work? Because I've never been in a broadcasting booth when you're trying to call a game. And are you right now at the current moment, are you in the same room with Jay or whoever it is? Like, are you guys calling the game together or is it through Zoom? So... All of the college basketball games that I have done so far this year have been in person. So we did, 
well, I did another grouping with John Crispin, but they were at the Mohegan Sun. They did a bubble. They did this thing called Bubbleville. Mm -hmm. Um, And we were at the casino, basically the way that one worked. We had risers. So we were like dueling DJs next to each other, like 20 feet apart. Normally, you know, you're right on top of each other. So we were there, but it was, there's a security guard at the end of my hallway. I really couldn't leave. When I went to the court for either practice or for the game, a security guard would come, escort me through a service elevator, down through the back of the house, underground, basically wouldn't see anybody. I was allowed to make an appointment to go to the gym for an hour a day. I could walk outside for an hour, but for the most part, I didn't leave my room. So we were in that setting. And then we just did the game at Cameron Indoor Stadium, which holds a little over 9,000. There were probably 100 people in the building, including the players and the coaches. And we were not as high as we normally are, which is up in that crow's nest. Duke's one of the few places where you're actually doing the game from above as opposed to courtside. The mandate is you have to be 25 feet back now. So we were kind of up in the the lowest level, but the highest part of the lowest level was where our booth was set up. And we were next to each other. We were, you know, eight feet apart. So that's that, what it's been. Does that mess up your rhythm? Because I know it's easier to work with somebody when they're right next to you and you kind of see what's going on. So that didn't, but, but doing the games on Zoom, <clears throat> um, you know, I did Korean baseball on Zoom. I worked an entire season this year with Chipper Jones. We did 20 some odd TV baseball games together. Mm -hmm. And he literally was not in the same room with me the entire time. And that sucked. I mean, I'll just say it It was terrible. Now we had some good games. I mean, like I experienced it. So look, I love baseball. I love it as much as I did when I was a little kid, but you come to realize that part of what I like about this job is connecting with people through the job, Mm -hmm. you know, like you played at old dominion, you know, I, I went and was a stinky uh, red shirt player. Like, I want to ask you 9 million questions right now. Mm -hmm. It's legit. And, but that's, and I love that. Yeah. And, and I get to do that in person with big league players, with general managers. And I've been doing it a long time. So I know them. You know, Chipper Jones, I've known for 24 years. Mm -hmm. And I miss not having him here. Yeah. And if he's next to me, like, I'm a a grabber. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not a small dude either. So, like, I mean, I'm I'll bully some people. And, like, I just miss that in person. So, you, what I realize is calling the games in person was great, just that was nice, but you just miss the in person connection. And it just makes it harder to vibe. And then just the mechanics of you speak, I speak, you speak. I, it just, it's just a little, it's a little harder. I think, especially for how I do it, where I mean, look, your standard baseball broadcast goes like this, radio or TV. When the pitcher pitches and the ball is in play, I speak. And when it is not in play, the analyst speaks. Now, when the ball's not in play, at times I will generate a conversation and I'll say, hey, what do you think about this? Or where'd you go to eat today? And when you're not in the same place, that extemporaneous organic stuff that you can stumble onto, that can be really fun and really great. It's just harder to pull off because Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, yeah. no, you go, you you go. And it's like, can I always ask you this, Alex, can I curse? Um, Yeah. Okay. No, it's fine. I'll, I'll edit myself. No, that's fine. Go for it. It's all good. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, you can swear. Well, I mean, it's just, yeah, after a while, you're doing, you know, you just want to have a conversation with a guy. It's like, fuck, let's go. That's what I wanted to say. Sorry. Yeah. So when you're 
were you calling the games from the room you're in right now? I called the Korean baseball games at five in the morning mm -hmm. from here. Here's my, you know, my wall with all my stuff back there and all the pictures and so forth that I, that honestly, this room didn't look like this before Korean baseball, uh -huh. you know, like I got my Pete Frady's Jersey, my buddy passed away from ALS. Yeah. Um, I called some of the radio. I called none of the TV. TV, they made me go to Bristol for every game <clears throat> um, and called for the studio up there. But, yeah, I called a good amount. I haven't done – it's weird because most guys have done their college basketball games this year from their house, and I haven't called a game yet from home. Here's – this is my, my setup here. Here's my – my uh, headset. They're my Christmas cards. Anyway. So. so I guess when you're calling the game at home, you can't see some things that you can see when you're actually at the ballpark. So no. how different was that? Like you want a good one. I mean, here's a great example that the average person that the people I work for don't even think about. All right. You here, here's what it is. <clears throat> this happened a couple of times and it stinks. And it's why, in my opinion, we have to be there besides the access and all that. But here's an example. It's late in the year. I'm doing Dodgers at Padres, not playoffs, but at Petco. Betts is at third. Turner's at the plate. Turner, it's a ground ball to Machado at third. Contacts on Mookie breaks for the plate. He knows he's a dead duck, and so he hits the brakes, and they run him back to third. There's a throw to third, close play, and the umpire is not in the shot. <laughs> and what you don't realize is this. The cameraman didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. He's shooting the play. He shoots the play. I'm there, and I see the umpire say, safe. And I tell you. And you don't even think about the fact that you're watching the play – and all you're seeing is in tight, his hand get in there, and you're processing, but you don't know what the call – I tell you what the call is because I'm at the game and I can see the umpire. And so it becomes bets back to third, and what just happened? I can't see. Anybody can see what just happened? <laughs> That's, it sucked. So – and then there's just the – you know, Eduardo Perez, the guy – Alex Cora, when I worked with him as another, when the ball is not in play, these guys <clears throat> observe the entire field and they see stuff and can see the field and things, you know, that I can't see or, you know, but you're always just looking and peeking at different things, whether it's a pinch hitter or, you know, I mean, it's funny, but just even as a joke, I mean, you, you sort of do it, where, you know, on radio, nobody knows, but if you're doing a Padre game on the radio and you're at the park, it's the radio. So, hey, singing now might be a good time for a visit from Larry Rothschild. And here he comes. You know what I mean? Like, they can't – well, I can't see the – all I'm getting is what they're showing me. I have an overhead nine, but it's not – it's hard. It was hard. Mm -hmm. And Boog, anyone that has listened to you either on another podcast or one that I've done, you know, we've talked about your favorite stories and it's stories about, I think very rarely, I think that one you just told about the slide with Mookie, that's your first story that is actually from a game. Like the stories usually right, right, yeah. are happening with David yeah. in the elevator or yeah. you're talking to um, a manager about what color candy's in their back pocket, right? Yeah. That's the stuff yeah. I care about. And now, obviously, not everyone's going to care about. Uh, well, look, I, it's, it is both. But I would still say at a fundamental level, people want to know what these guys are like. Mm -hmm. Right? Isn't that – I mean, that's still – the you, you root, hey, what's Aaron Judge like? You know what I mean? It's that type of – so I just – yeah, I, I, I mean – Look, I, if, if I sat here and told stories all day, I certainly would have stuff that in, involves on the field also. But it's, yes, I, I think that 
humanizing these guys, turning them into <clears throat> three-dimensional forms is important. It connects people even more so to, yeah, to the, to the players on the field. So I, and I love that part of it. I do. So you said that you went to William and Mary. Yeah. Which, which means and then I graduated from Boston college. So mm -hmm. I, I left and transferred. So that means we're natural rivals. Um, <laughs> right. So, that, so that's a good start for this, but yes. when did you know you wanted to get into broadcasting? Was it when you were at William Mary? Was it a little bit later? Was it earlier? I think as a kid, I knew it, it could be so. I probably was more interested in being a talk show host or something along those lines, and then it evolved. But I think I always knew William and Mary does not have a communications program, so it gives you an idea that it's a liberal arts school. So yeah, I wanted to play. I like playing. I mean that I like playing. I just you know wasn't good enough, but. Um, I think as a kid, you know, my, my dad has tape recordings of me as a kid. And I certainly was the type of kid. I was the type of kid that was not scared of adults as it related to conversation. So that when I'm six and somebody who's 30 is like, what's up, little guy? I'd be like, how you doing? You know, I, that, that was me. Um, so I think that, that there was always something kind of, kind of there mm -hmm. with it. So that's what I would say. You know, when people always see, you know, people I've met or whatever, they're like, do you ever get starstruck? And I know you don't, you know, really ever get starstruck. There's been times I'm sure in your career where you get excited or something. Do you always feel like that, you know, like you said, you want to make the players three-dimensional. We talked about it before, but do you feel like it is part of almost like your responsibility? like as a broadcaster in the year 2020, going into 2021, that at some form it is up to you, the broadcaster, to make these players relatable, to make them relatable to the fans and not yeah. just like what we said before, a stratomatic yeah. card or a video game. Yeah, I, I, no, there's no question. Uh, you know, it's funny, you bring up Starstruck, but it, I think, and, and I know what you're getting at, and, I, and I'll give you a couple of things on it. So like, it's hard. It, it's almost as if that gets turned off with today's players. Now, part of it is I'm a lot older, but like, I still think that people want to hear from, you know, I remember being in Anaheim for an angels game and running into Mike Trout and him saying, what's up to me. And then I said, you know, my, I I've kept been meaning to tell you my, my grandfather was head of construction for Veterans Stadium, and Mike Trout's a huge Eagles fan. And he, like, stopped, and his eyes got really big, and he went, oh, no shit, tell me about it. And he was totally locked in. And it was just this great back and forth. Now, I covered those Phillies teams that went to the playoffs five straight years and won the World Series in 2008. I got to call Roy Halladay's playoff no-hitter. And at some juncture during that stretch, somewhere between 05 and 10 or 11, I was in the Phillies clubhouse and waiting to interview somebody and Gary Maddox walked by. I don't know whether either of you know who Gary Maddox is, but my favorite team as a kid was, so this is my, these on my wall as a kid were, was this poster right here, Mike Schmidt and Steve Carlton, it's a Nike poster, MVP Cy Young with the bats on fire. So the 198 and that year in 80, the Phillies won the World Series. Schmidt and Carlton uh, won MVP and Cy Young. And Gary Maddox was the center fielder on that team. And the line about Gary Maddox was two thirds of the world is covered by water. The other third by Gary Maddox. And it's one of those where I'm standing in the hallway and Gary, Ma and Gary Maddox is a good player. I don't even know whether Gary, Gary Maddox probably won a few gold gloves. I don't know that he was ever an all-star. <clears throat> but it's Gary Maddox. And all of a sudden, I'm 10 again. And, like, I'd been at it a while. And so there was a moment I can remember for me where I was like, holy shit, Gary Maddox. And, like, I introduced myself, and I was kind of nervous. And so it, you still have some of it. The one other one – 
that was in a moment that was funny was I went, I'm going to go name drop on you guys. You all right with that? Yeah, please do. I spent a lot of time around Rick Sutcliffe. <laughs> so like Rick Sutcliffe, big time name dropper. So <clears throat> during the 09 World Series, Yankees, Phillies, I wasn't living here in New York, but I was doing pre post for ESPN radio. We went to dinner on the off night and it was me, Mark Grace, Eric Karros, Rick Sutcliffe, Dave O'Brien. And Sut was like, yeah, my buddy Murray's going to come. You know, he said to wait and he called him twice. So he's like, yeah, we can't order till Murray gets here. And then like, he's like, oh, he's here. All right. You know, and Murray comes and sits down across from me and it was Bill Murray. And I, you know, like, and I about pooped my pants. I was like, oh, Murray. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and then there was another funny one <clears throat> where Sut, I'm actually, I'm now turning into Sut. So Sut likes to make fun of me for, uh, that nobody knows who I am, which is true. I mean, Rick Sutcliffe won the Cy Young and Rookie of the Year. And like in Chicago, He's a big deal. And nationally, people, you know, he's 6'7". I mean, he was great. Like, he wasn't a Hall of Famer, but Rick Sutcliffe was great. So nobody knows who I am. There was a great one. I'm not telling the Mike Schmidt. He, he just buried me in front of Mike Schmidt, my childhood hero. He asked Mike Schmidt, in front, he, looked, he turned to Mike Schmidt, and he was like, do you know who this is? And Mike Schmidt was like, looked me up and down, like nose to toes. And he was like, no, who are you? And then they both like roared laughing and like a little part of my soul died. So the, the, the other Bill Murray, I mean, I, I am just wandering right now. But the other Bill Murray story was a couple of spring trainings ago. Sut gets mad at me and he's like, I'm going to call Bill Murray and I'm going to ask him if he knows who you are. So he called and Bill Murray is notorious for never answers his phone. So I'm like, I'm in good shape. He's not answering his phone. And he picks up. And Sut across the table says, I just got one question for you. He's a couple of Coors Lights in. And Sut, and he says, do you know who John Shambi is? And then there's like a pause. He's like, you do? Oh, that is awful. And he hands me the phone. And as God is my witness, Bill Murray, I just, I say, Hello? And the voice on the other end of the phone says, I just want you to know, we all really appreciate what you go through with him. <laughs> <laughs> and I just go, do you think you'd be willing to maybe record that sentence for me at some point? He's like, absolutely. I was like, all right, I'll talk to you later. And I just gave it back to Sutton. <laughs> that was it. Well, so kind of while we're on that subject, do you find that now with, players coming up have listened to you their entire lives pretty much watching baseball that some some of the younger guys are starstruck by you or approach you not or starstruck but like I, look does it happen a lot god no has it happened yeah and it's funny to me it's funny like the guys are like Dansby Swanson got picked in the first round I'm hosting baseball tonight and I go to interview him and we're about to start the interview. He's like, hey, can I just ask you a quick question? Did you used to do the Braves? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I used to listen to you as a kid. I was like, I mean, so yeah, you get you get that every once in a while. And it's 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 really flattering. It's really, it's it's super cool. It's it's not as much as I would like so that I could tell Rick Sutcliffe, but it's, it's <laughs> I think that would be enough because I think that's just doing your job the right way. And that's all that really matters. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, in all seriousness, I, more than anything, I want to have credibility in the clubhouse that to have the rep that I work hard at it, that I want to get one second. You brought up credibility. Let me ask you that follow-up. How do you feel like what is the biggest piece to truly build credibility in a major league clubhouse in today's age? This is a question specifically for Alex. <laughs> be there, be there. You go up and, and you do the uncomfortable stuff. Like you go up and you introduce yourself to guys and then you reintroduce yourself to them the next time you see them. And then you introduce yourself to them again, the next time you see them. 
And the next time you see him and you engage them in conversation, you got to be there. You got to be there. You know, I, I think if there was one thing that I took, and I guess I have some of this as a national guy, like they get it. But so when I first started in Miami, you know, the time was different. So it's 1997. But like beat writers were the everyday guys. And those were the guys that the players saw all the time. And then plus the announcers, like columnists had power, but they wouldn't be there every day. So it would be like, you know, the Marlins would lose five straight and then the columnists would write, I don't know if this team's good enough. And then the next day, he wouldn't be in the clubhouse. And they'd be like, oh, you're going to go ahead and write that and then you're not going to come in front of us. So I just think, yeah. I, and if there's ever anything that somebody has, you know, an issue with what you've said, I think you, you deal with it head on. But I, I think that you got to work and ask questions to the guys that are, that are involved in it. And, and it puts you in a position, you're doing it in their space. You're asking them to give you their time and it's not comfortable um, always. And you just gotta, you just gotta deal with it. Um, is is what I would say and you know as well be willing to admit when you were wrong but I I think more than anything I it's it's showing up is a big part of it now what do you think with everything that kind of we've been through this year when things transition hopefully back to normal here as soon as possible what do you think will stay um from your side when we get back to to normal I don't know I I have great fear to be honest i have great fear as it relates to start with access i have a lot of fear about access i don't think that the players association gets it i don't think the players i think they need to do a better job of, of letting of giving the players an understanding of what the media is about how it works like there's just a there, there is a fundamental lack of understanding of journalism and media I think a certain segment of the teams and players in any sport think that the media's job to some degree is to promote. And it's not. It's to report first and foremost. I don't think that they understand that. And then the thing in the two-way that I don't think – the reason why I don't think the sides will ever get it is – the media guys are always saying, I didn't make it personal. Although in today's world of Twitter, it inches a little more towards personal. But the, 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 broad, the broadcasters and the writers always say, I didn't say he was a bum. I just said he isn't hitting well. And the part that the media people don't understand is that <clears throat> in sports, the job is way more tied to uh, the person's identity than ours is. So if I say you stink as a player, Vinny, I'm kind of saying you. most players are experiencing it as you stink as a person. And I, I don't think that the media side get, like they say, media people like to say, I didn't make it personal. It's always personal. Mm -hmm. The players always take it personally. And I don't and I don't think that we completely, you know, get that part of it. As far as so I think access could be reduced. Um, I'll tell you one of the things that stinks, but it's just the way of the world. I don't think the fans care and they should care. I don't think the fans understand that as your access decreases, you are not being served. You know, you may not like the sideline interview on the college football game, but know a couple of things. We pay for it. We negotiated it. There's a reason Nick Saban gets paid $11 million. You know, at least four of those dollars are because ESPN is paying billions for college football. So indirectly, he's getting part of that. And I do think it is at least a little bit incumbent on all the players and coaches to step back 
and I'm not like, and it doesn't mean that we are without blame, it's, but to step back and recognize, now that we've already jumped the shark on it, but to recognize this idea, okay, fine, you don't want to talk to us, but hypothetically, then we won't broadcast your games. And you guys, instead of making $2 million, you can make $20,000. How's that? We won't cover you. We'll leave you alone. But like, there's, you get paid a lot of money because these games are on TV, because people are paying a lot of money for it. And part of it is the access and connecting. And like, I don't begrudge, make as much as you want, but I do think that sometimes the players lose sight of that connection, that there is, these things are all kind of layered together. And what's the purpose of the media? And not so much me, but they can't let everybody into the clubhouse. So you're a conduit for the fans. Mm -hmm. So like one of the things that stinks is the fans don't necessarily see it that way, but like the guy's basically going in on, you know, behalf of Mike on a mobile, you know what I mean? So that's, that's how that works. And then in terms of our, uh, our stuff, I think, you know, under the guise of health, I think you're going to see a lot of cost cutting and, and just the viewer experience is not going to be served. So I do think that even though we'll be healthy, I think you're going to see, you know, in seven years, do I think that the Royals are sending their announcers on the road? No, I don't. Hmm. I don't do I think Next year, do I think our Monday and Wednesday announcers will be on the road at ESPN? I'm not sure. So how's that for a nice long-winded answer? I mean, we could go in and we could talk about what you just brought up for the next three hours because you brought up some great points there. And um, But this is our favorite part of the show to wrap up the interview. It's a new segment. We've only done it two other times. It's called – Balls and strikes, but actually, since your interview book is going out next week, yes. you're actually the first person that yes. our audiences are hearing this segment. So <laughs> this is the real test. To yeah. Like we've done it before, but those episodes aren't going out for later. It's called balls and strikes. So oh, hang on, let me interrupt for a second, Vinny. Did you sign off on this idea, balls and strikes? Yes, it was actually brought to my attention by friends of mine that it'd be a, a fun idea. So I brought it. So down. here's the thing, like this is this. So this is there's a lot of pressure right now because like this could absolutely suck. And this would be one of those things in like two years, like Vinny will call up Alex and I'm like, remember when we thought that balls and strikes thing was going to be really good. And we did it with that, the redheaded guy and it stunk. I thought it was going to be good, but it stunk. <laughs> so here we go. All right, so the idea of the game is called Balls and Strikes. Vinny has been really hard on me about my questions at times, saying that – Pushing Alex to ask better questions. Right. And so I asked a not very good question, and so this is where – What was the not very good question? So the question was, uh, what's one TV show that you love that everyone hates? Okay. And Vinny said that was a terrible question. I just didn't think it was worded very well. It's a very tough question to answer. You mean like on the fly? Oh, on the fly. We were live doing the interview with a, a Cubs prospect. That's hard. So that's a hard question that like that. I think that it, I think as a question, it's fine. I think that that's one of those, it's got to be a little more casual because like I, and that's, I mean, hell, I, I've seen, you know, Jay Billis ask Jay Wright, on, you know, in a taped segment, what's your favorite TV show? And <clears throat> Jay Wright totally choked. He was like, I don't know. <laughs> I think if I flipped it the other way, it's one TV show right. that you hate that everyone loves. I'll give you one. Can I, can I, by the way, just, I need to jump in on this. I'm in the middle of something with my brother right now. So, like, I'm a nice enough dude, but I'm, I can be judgy. So, like, and I don't know whether you guys are down with this, but uh, with TV shows... If certain people are telling me the TV show is really good, you're going to hate it. And I think that person's an asshole. <laughs> so it's like my brother's like, you've got to watch The Undoing. And then my friend's like, you've got to watch The Undoing. And then I'm on like Instagram and whatever. And these D-bags that I follow to hate follow, 
I really am revealing too much here. But I'm like, oh, they like the undoing. That show's got to suck. And so my brother's like, you got to watch the undoing. The undoing's good. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. I'm like, I'm not. I, I no, no. Yeah, that Alex will text me and tell me to post on our Instagram page. And the more he texts me about it, the less and less that I want to do it. Just yeah. to fight him. Be like, nope, not doing anything. Yeah. Go ahead, Alex. All right. So balls and strikes. And you the- know what's funny about it is that I connect with both of you on this one. <laughs> like I, I am Alex, but I'm also Vinny. Like I legitimately am. Like I like I identify I d- ID with Alex. Like I th- like Alex like works hard at this. He's kind of tortured about it. Like he he thinks about it a lot. He wants to keep sort of like polishing himself. And yeah, and, and Vinny's kind of a jackass about it. And yep. I respect that because I kind of am too. It's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Boo. Well, that's what it's like. I said, you know, I, David Ross and I, when we worked together, but the thing I would always say about David Ross on Dancing with the Stars, and he's got the smile and all that. And David Ross is hashtag sneaky asshole. Everybody's like, oh, Rossi, he's the nicest guy. No, sneaky asshole. I have a little bit of that. Right. No, no. And Vinny has some of that too. So I get a text from Vinny the other night, boo. He goes, how tall are you? And I go, well, I'm the same height as Ken Rosenthal and Bob Costas. <laughs> and, and, and he goes, you're that short. <laughs> and I go, wow. the license does say I'm five, four. And then he sent me a screenshot of me, like with my friends on Instagram. He goes, I didn't realize you were this short. <laughs> And I go, I'm calling HR. And then he goes, I am yeah. HR. So, <laughs> <laughs> really well okay. Sorry, balls and strikes. Let's go. Can we still do balls and strikes? Yeah. Yeah. So balls and strikes, the idea is we ask a question. Vinny and I will we'll go back and forth. We ask a question. Yeah. You determine yeah. if the question is a ball or a strike. And the first okay. person to a strikeout wins. Okay. Strike, strike being good question. Bad. Yeah. yeah. I got it. All right. Vinny, do you want to go first or, or should I? Oh, you've won. You've won. I, Another circle. I, won. I just like to say after the conversation that we just had, I am so into this right now. I can't <laughs> tell you. I mean, like, I like I'm already telling you that we're just I need you to do it fast, but I'm already like at the end of it, I'm gonna be like, let's play again. All right, go ahead. Come on, let's go. All right. What would be the worst gift you've ever received? Ball. You can answer it though. Like oh. you can answer the question too. Um but I don't know if that one you should answer because you might offend someone listening. Yeah, I don't want to offend anybody. There, there's something you know what you know the answer it's not the i don't know i don't know the yeah the worst gift i'm not i don't know yeah i'm uh, not gonna get anywhere good on that out of all the people that you've met you know in baseball who is the best leader that you've ever seen in person ball i, I just, like i i don't like i'm not there when they're leading and leadership mm. is not something that really i i don't I, I get a glimpse, a tr- true glimpse at leadership in really small spurts. So even though I, I answered that, but like, I'm not saying Derek Jeter, so fuck off if you think that's what I mean. <laughs> go ahead, Alex. All right. So I'm behind in the count one and oh. I'm going to go. Yeah. You both three. are. Yeah, we both are. God. I, I'm going to go for Vinny, it. Are you a pitcher or a hitter? I play first base. You got Eric Hosmer's number back there, huh? It's an Eric Hosmer jersey. <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. All right, dig it. All right. When was the last time you surprised yourself? Strike. I – there's a lot of good answers on that one, but, like, I lost 70 pounds last year. I didn't think I could do that. Good for you. I'm so. down 30 this year, Boog. You inspired me. Good. Oh. I like it. Stay the course. I'm up 10. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So count one and one for me. Um, if you had a warning label attached to you, what would it say? Sneaky asshole. Strike. 
All right. And then the third one. So it's a one, two count here. Yeah. What is the longest you've gone without sleep? Can I say strike, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I actually like that question, especially as a guy who's calling games at 430. So I, I will so I'll say strike. So what? Vinny's done. Anyway. Wait, uh, so look at that. Here's what I here's what I'll tell you. So I got one of those aura rings. You know what an aura ring is? Yeah. An aura ring. They they were using them down in the uh, I love that I, I, I went like this, like just in case you guys didn't know what a ring was. Um I, they, they, they measure your, they sort of measure your sleep every night. And then it also does like your resting heart rate at night. They had them down in the NBA bubble. They gave them to the players um, to take in certain piece of information for uh, COVID, et cetera. Anyway, this system needs a lot of sleep. Like I need a lot of sleep. So like I'm somebody, if you give me six hours of sleep, five straight days, and then you let me sleep like just six, like I'm not talking like four, six hours of sleep, five straight days, the sixth day. And you let me sleep. I'm going 10. I just need, I need a lot of sleep. And it, the sleep score that they deliver on the aura ring only confirms it's basically, it's like, it's like bonds, like Barry bonds, 1993 Barry Bonds was as good as it gets. And then he took that stuff and went off the charts. Like I am Barry Bonds of sleep. Like I am that good of a sleeper. Wow. If, if you guys kept asking me questions, I have to go, but like for the next 10 minutes, you could keep asking questions. And if I sat here and, and had to like, try to go to sleep, I probably could fall asleep right in the middle of this. It has nothing to do with you guys. I'm just that good at it. All right, before I let you go, I have to ask our most contentious question of the podcast. Do you prefer drinking out of glass or plastic? Oh. Glass or – and it's just that. It's just that. Or you could pick styrofoam, Yeti cup, whatever. No styrofoam. No styrofoam in my life. Uh – I think probably plastic. Mm. Interesting. Interesting answer. Mm -hmm. So I don't I, like, I'm not a water bottle. I, I, I recycle just cause that's the way I get, I keep track of and get the water into my system. Mm -hmm. And the last question we have for you on the podcast, what in your opinion is the best position in baseball? Uh, it's not first base, Vinny. You got no shot. Yeah, that's just the wrong answer. I mean, just beat it. You're on the wrong end of the defensive spectrum. You're playing tackle the baseball over there. I guess it's like, it's, I'd say it's catcher or shortstop. Interesting. It's catcher or shortstop. It's a good, this is a great place to end the show right now. Just get him out of here. <laughs> he stood up. <laughs> Stood up. We just do it on a daily basis, okay? Um, uh, I I thoroughly enjoyed this, you guys. I'm sorry that I I was not more efficient with my answers, but Alex, you you know that this is how I roll. So, <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming on. This was great. Yeah. yeah. So again, to wrap it up quick, blow yourself up, as Vinny says. Where can the people follow you? Give your 30 second elevator pitch. Oh, God. Fans can follow you all on social media. I'm at Boog Shambi on Twitter, S C I A M B I. I am at uh, Boog ESPN on Instagram. I also have a cameo account, and, and I'll be your monkey if you want and say stuff for your friends. And it goes to my charity that helps uh, people living with ALS. I help run a charity called Project Main Street in honor of my friend Tim Sheehy. So. Awesome. Boog, thanks again for coming on today. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks, you guys. It was, uh, it was great to do. Vinny, Alex, thank you. What an interview with John Boog Shambi. He is one of the greatest of all time.
And this was actually the first episode that we tried out our new segment. What do you think, people? Let us know. I'm a huge fan of Balls and Strikes. I don't know about Vinny or not, but I just love the fact that I'm now officially 1-0 in this tournament. Are you going to ask me how I feel about it or just say that you don't know how I feel? Would you like to know? I would like to know how you feel about it. I don't know yet. I'm still feeling it out. I think it gets a little bit awkward with the guests because they don't want to rip us a new one if we ask them a terrible question. Um, so we'll see as we move on if that sticks or if it doesn't stick. But we'll see. I mean, we just want everybody to come off naturally um, with everything that they're talking about. So we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable in our interviews. And yeah. if they think it's a bad question, we want them to we want them to say that. Yeah. No, 100 percent. And um, by the way, we've recorded the intro before NFL Sunday and we're filming the outro at the end of NFL Sunday. And Vinny, I got to give you credit. You're right again. Um, you were right again. Jets. Jets, baby. They shock the world. One in 13. My phone's been lighting up. And unbelievable. People are, most people hate that they won. If you're a Jets fan, most people hate it. I will never support a losing culture, ever. I will never, ever root for a tank. It's not in my DNA. I will never say, oh, let's lose games so we can go get a certain guy. It's not my style. Look at Patrick Mahomes. Did he go number one overall? Alex, answer me that question. Did Patrick Mahomes go number one overall? You make a great point there, Vinny. You make a great point. And I get it. I get it. Generational talents, whatever. That makes sense. Business-wise, you need to go get the best player available if it is right there in front of you. That's not something I can get down with. The Jets yeah. today proved exactly what I said this morning. When we filmed the intro, they play hard and they finish every play. And that's what they did today. It's a scrappy group of guys who went out and won a football game today. And the announcers were all over how the Rams came out flat. This was a quote from an announcer during this game. Oh, well, both of these teams play with no fans in their stadium, but, uh, you know, the Rams have just come out super flat today, and it must be because there's no fans in the stands. That is just an unbelievable quote. If, it, if they've been playing with fans not in the stands all year long, don't you think they'd be used to it? What is it about today? That's just an excuse because the Jets were beating the brakes off the Rams early in the game. Now, the Rams did come back, but the Jets held off. And that's what good football teams do. And I don't want to, I don't want to start blowing the Jets up and calling them a good football team because they don't deserve that. They're one in thirteen. But winning that game is something that good football teams do. You hold the comeback team to not come back, and that is what they did. I'm very happy about it. And if it costs them from getting the number one quarterback in the draft, whatever. We learned how to win a football game today. I'm not going to fret. Do I want the number one quarterback? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I don't know if quarterback is going to solve all the issues that the Jets have had. So I'm going to be happy with the win. I'm not going to complain about it because I just like – I like winning football, and that is what we did today. And I could not be more happy about it. And you listeners, I hope you can feel my energy because it's real right now. I'm pumped that the Jets won a football game. And I – oh, man, that's just very, very exciting. Vinny's all pumped up at the end of this episode. It's a Monday – episode and Alex, Alex do you want to discuss my picks from today that's because right your picks are also on fire because let's let's go through the list Colts victory Bears victory Titans victory Ravens victory Dolphins victory 49ers loss Seahawks victory Buccaneers victory Jets victory Cardinals looks like a victory there's 30 seconds left we'll see what happens there and then Chiefs up by seven with nine minutes left. Looks like a victory. We don't know yet. But if you add every game that's done with now, I'm at eight and one on the day. That is an unbelievable day, Alex. And we've still got four games left technically with the game still going on, added up with the games that still need to happen. But I can't go under 500 on the day, which is huge. I could not be more happy. It feels good to get in the win column to remember what that it's been a while. It has been a while, and it feels good to know this feeling again. So I'm just happy with it. And, and again, you know, another PSA to Jets fans, just remember the Bills game. We went up 10 nothing early, 
and then lost it. The Chargers game where we went up early, lost it. The Raiders game where we were up the whole time, lost it. Not the whole time, but at the end we were up, lost it. There's been plenty of games where we were up and blew it. So don't act like this is the worst football team you've ever seen. We've been in games, and we've lost those games. It's not like we've been blown out every single game. This is probably somewhere near a 5-11 and football team. So I love the victory. I could not be more happy. But also I'm happy that Boog Shambi was on the show today and everybody could hear that. And I'm really excited for tomorrow when Brooks Webb hops on, hops on the podcast and drops some absolute knowledge to all you people out there. I could not be more excited for that. I couldn't agree with you anymore. So to finish out the episode, leave that five-star review. If you're listening to us or if you're watching us, be sure to subscribe and comment below and drop a like on YouTube. But anyways, now have a great rest of your Monday and we will be seeing you tomorrow.